Okay. So uh, like so many uh, COVID friendships, I don't think I have ever met Chet Van Duzer in person until today, but we've known each other now for a couple of years. Um, and I have uh, greatly appreciated uh, Chet. He is a rare combination of talents. Scholar, prolific author, great speaker, and knowledgeable about so many esoteric topics that we all love. These were the books that I could find, Chet. You'll have to tell me later if I got them all. Um, his book, Frames That Speak, that's the one second on the bottom row, second from the right. Um, uh, Cartouches and Early Modern Maps was published by Brill in July. And his current project in the lower right is on self-portraits by cartographers that appear on maps. His talk is Maps in Power. Well, thank you, Tom, for that generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to the California Map Society for the invitation and uh, to the Rumsey Center for hosting, of course. Uh, so yes, today I'll be talking about maps and power. And uh, the, the goal of the talk uh, is that uh, there's a lot of literature about the relationship between maps and power. But my experience is that it tends to be on the theoretical side. And what I wanna do today is go through some concrete examples that allow us to see to explore the nature of that relationship in different cases. So I'll begin with a few quotations, uh, some of which will perhaps be familiar, others will not. And then we'll go into some concrete examples and, and explore the different ways in which the relationship between maps and power can express itself. So uh, going back to the Renaissance, uh, Christopher Marlowe's play, Tamburlaine, uh, Tamburlaine, the, the conqueror, says, give me a map, then let me see how much is left for me to conquer all the world. So a very clear, uh, yes. Uh, I'm not remembering the exact date of the play, but it is early 17th century or late, late 16th, perhaps. Uh, this is a, a less familiar quote uh, from Gaspar Melchor de uh, Jovellanos, the map without whose light politicians will not make a calculation without error, will not conceive a plan without mistake, will not take a single step without stumbling, without whose guidance the most prudent economy will not be able, without the risk of wasting its funds or failing to meet its goals, to navigate a river, open an irrigation canal, build a road or a new port, or any of those designs that by opening the sources of public wealth make the provinces flourish and increase the true splendor of the nations. Uh, Yves Lacoste, uh, the title of his 1976 book was Geography Exists, First of All, to Make War. Um, and uh, moving on to the literature of the history of cartography, maps are specialized intellectual weapons by which power could be gained, administered, given legitimacy, and codified from J.B. Harley and David Woodward's The History of Cartography, Volume 1. Uh, Harley, in one of his articles, Maps, Knowledge, and Power, says maps facilitate the technical conduct of warfare but also palliate the sense of guilt which arises from its conduct. The silent lines of the paper landscape foster the notion of socially empty space. So moving into some concrete examples, we have here uh, an illustration from Lambert of saint Omer's Liber Floridas. Uh, the, this is the uh, autograph manuscript which was made in about the year 1121. And we have this portrait of the Emperor Augustus holding a traditional medieval T.O. Mapamundi as a symbol of his power. It's worth pointing out that in his other hand, he has a sword, uh, but in his, uh, his left hand, he holds this image of the world. And the text around him says that it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And the Latin word that I translate as registered is a tricky one. Um, it's difficult to know what exactly was intended by that, but it's sort of a, a, a survey of some nature of the world. So 
in addition to the Mapamundi representing his power, it's also a reference to this effort he made to, quote unquote, register the world. The world as the ruler's monogram. This is a, a fun one. So we saw before uh, the a typical medieval Mapamundi, the so-called TO map. Uh, we have the circle of the O, which is the circumfluent ocean surrounding the three traditional continents, uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa, which are separated by this T shape. So that's why it's called a TO Mapamundi. These are quite familiar, I think. We've all seen these before. The one on the left is much less common. Uh, it's the so-called V in square Mapamundi. It's not hard to figure out where that name came from. Um, but just to look at a couple of other examples of these Mapamundi, uh, here we have one from the 13th century. And we have the th names of the three sons of Noah. And uh, the Bible says that Noah divided uh, the world among his three sons. It, the Bible does not say that he assigned one continent to each son. That was a medieval development of this idea. But uh, this map reflects that medieval idea that Noah assigned uh, Europe and Asia and Africa to his three sons. And that is the equivalence. So it's a very strange map. I'm not going to spend too much time uh, explaining its, its history and the details of it. I want to move on to this very curious use of the map uh, in a manuscript of a universal chronicle called the Mare Historiarum. Um, and only one of the surviving, I believe, five manuscripts of the work is illustrated. And that's uh, a manuscript in the National Library of France, uh, Latin manuscript for 915, which has a total of 730 miniatures, so 730 illustrations. The map was painted in 1447 to 1455 for the Chancellor of France, Yom Juvenal des Ursins, who lived from 1400 to 1472, and he is everywhere in the manuscript. So at the beginning of the manuscript, we have this image of him coming to visit his copyist who is working on making manuscripts for him. But he's also present in the manuscript in many other ways. So his coat of arms appears in the manuscript many times. There are many of the initial illustrated initial letters have a bear in them. And the Latin name for bear is Ursa, or French Urs. And this is a pun on his name. So it's another way that he's present in the manuscript. There's also many, many of the illuminated initial letters have a plant known as Ursine, uh, which is another allusion to his name. And so where does the, the V and square map come in? It comes in here uh, on folio 26V. We zoom in. Here is this image. It's not explained in the text, uh, but knowing that such a thing as a V and square map exists, we can see that that's what this is. It's a, gra a substantial graphic elaboration of a V and square map. And we have these depictions of the peoples of the three continents. And unsurprisingly, the peoples of Africa and Asia are indicated as being monstrous. But the question is, why is it that the artist would choose such an unusual type of Mapamundi to, uh, to use in this manuscript? And this is another allusion to the name of the patron. So the V uh, is the first letter of his name. So it's another way in which he's present in the manuscript, in the manuscript's decorative program. Um, and so, as I hinted with the, the title of this section, the world becomes a monogram of the, uh, the person who uh, commissioned this manuscript. So a very interesting deployment of a map in support of political power. Controlling time and space. So this is the Galleria delle Carte Geografiche in the Vatican, uh, which was commissioned in 1580 by Pope Gregory XIII. Perhaps some of us have visited the Vatican and had the chance to see this spectacular hallway 
with maps of Italy on either side. So there are 40 panel maps which show all of Italy and they were painted by Ignazio Danti from 1580 to 1583. And the scholar Marica Milanese has noted that Pope Gregory commissioned these maps when the temporal power of the papacy was on the rise. And she argues that he ordered their creation the better to determine what actions were necessary for Italy's government and to secure its peace. So these were maps that were intended to be used in the deployment of temporal power. Milanese also notes that this ambitious program of mapping of all of Italy at an unprecedentedly large scale, it's worth emphasizing, followed by just a few years, Pope Gregory's reform of the calendar. So the Gregorian calendar, which we're, with which we're all familiar. So with these projects, the church and Gregory in particular were asserting control over both space and time. Um, moving forward in time a little bit, jousting for, on sea monsters for sea power. So we have a, a spectacular manuscript map of Europe here made in 1598 uh, by a Dutch cartographer, uh, Evert Giesbert, which is in Prague in the Charles University uh, map collection. So it's oriented with west at the top. So we have North Africa on the left, Northern Europe on the right, and just to orient ourselves a little bit better, there's the boot of Italy in the middle. There's the Iberian Peninsula. And we'll zoom in on the Atlantic Ocean here, where we have multiple sovereigns riding sea monsters, symbolically competing for control of the Atlantic. So here we have Spain. So the, the king of Spain holds the, the flag of Spain and is riding this sea monster. The king of France, who is, it's worth pointing out, much smaller than the king of Spain, suggesting that France has a, a lesser role in the Atlantic. England, the Netherlands, and Denmark. So an interesting way, a symbolic, artistic way of indicating this contest for control and power in the Atlantic. So maps have often been used to try to proclaim possession of land. And we'll just uh, look at one example of that. Another, another map by the same cartographer and made one year later in 1599. It's a map of Africa and the Indian Ocean and Asia. So just to orient ourselves, here's Africa and Japan towards the eastern limit of the map. And we have this tremendous collection of Portuguese flags on the eastern coast of Africa, the southern coast of Asia, and also in Southeast Asia. And looking at these flags, you would think that Portugal controlled all of this territory, uh, whereas in fact, it really just refers to some uh, trading posts and, and factories as they were called. Uh, so graphically, the map indicates a much greater control of territory uh, than Portugal could possibly pretend to. To conquer by sword and compass. So this is the frontispiece and title page of Milicia y Descripción de las Indias, a book by Bernardo de Vargas Machuca, uh, published in Madrid in 1599. And the book is a practical guide to how to conquer Chile, written by a soldier with years of experience in the New World. And so he depicts himself, and he has one hand on his sword, and the other holds a pair of dividers uh, to a globe that prominently depicts the New World, and below the text says, with the sword and the compass, more and more and more and more. So he depicts uh, cartography 
as just as important in the conquest of the new world as the sword. The imposition of colonial place names, so this is a subject that, that just arose. Um, the imposition of colonial place names is, is a, one of the classic techniques for cartographically robbing indigenous peoples of uh, their territory or trying to do so. But this is a rare case where we can see that process in action. So here we have John Smith's uh, famous map of New England from 1616. And the text on the map says the most remarkable parts thus named, meaning were thus named, by the high and mighty Prince Charles, Prince of Great Britain. So John Smith consulted with Prince Charles about how these places in the New World should be named. And in uh, Smith's accompanying text, a description of New England, uh, printed in 1616, we have this list of the barbarous so-called indigenous place names and the new names that had been imposed by Prince Charles. So again, a rare case where we can see the names, the original indigenous place names and the names that were imposed to replace them. So usually we only see the results of that process. And here I've circled all of the uh, new uh, assigned colonial place names that were chosen by Prince Charles. Um, and yes, the indigenous presence in and, and inhabitation of and ownership of these lands is effectively effaced with a pretense of European possession. Whole Pacific at stake. So I'll describe the taking of the Spanish ship Rosario by the English privateer Bartholomew Sharp in July of 1681. So this is a map that shows Bartholomew Sharp's course around South America. The map was made by Basil Ringrose in 1685. So first Sharp went marauding up the western coast of South America and then sailed back to the Caribbean all the way around South America. And it was in this area where Sharp took the Spanish ship Rosario. And one of the things he captured was a Spanish derrotero, which is uh, a type of atlas that supplies all of the information one needs about a certain area to navigate there and survive there. And we don't have, uh, we don't know what manuscript uh, Sharp captured, but this is a similar Spanish derrotero. Uh, this one is from 1677, it's in the Naval Museum in Madrid. And what we have is very detailed uh, depiction of the coastline with lots of textual information about the resources that were available, where you should anchor, and so on and so forth. So this was fantastically detailed information about the whole west coast of the New World from Mexico south to the southern tip of South America. It was a document something like this that Sharp captured. And just to show another um, folio, uh, another opening from the same manuscript with, again, this very detailed information about the coastline and the resources available. And we have an account of the capture of this ship. So this day, about six o'clock in the morning, we spied a sail and I gave chase. And about eight o'clock at night, I took her. She came from Guayaquil and was bound to Panama. Her cargo for the most part was silver and cocoa. And in her, I found a parcel of manuscripts in Spanish of maps and writing of untold value, for it plainly shows all the ports, bays, roads, harbors, creeks, rivers, plantations, towns, settlements, soundings, shoals, sands, rocks, islands, sea cliffs, dangers, products, trade, where to find wood, water, and taking all sorts of provisions, where to build or refit a ship, where to find mines, sugar, brandy, oil, etc., and directions how to sail a ship into any of their harbors, meaning the Spanish harbors, and the true distance of the mines of silver and bearings from Arica in Peru. 
they were going to throw them overboard. The Spanish were going to throw this derrotero overboard, but my men prevented it, which made the Spanish captain cry out in Spanish, farewell, South Sea, meaning farewell, Pacific, meaning that with the English capture of these maps, the, the, the English could take control in the Pacific, that the, det the knowledge was that detailed. And truly by the help of the maps, uh, these manuscripts, navigation in the South Seas is made practicable. So this was a tremendous coup for the English. The manuscript was taken back to uh, London and was copied. Many manuscript copies were made of this uh, work by uh, an English cartographer, William Hack, and distributed to nobles in England. So the English had this opportunity presented by this knowledge. As it happened, they didn't take advantage of it. But the, the Spanish captain's cry, farewell South Seas, is very indicative of the potential for the change in the fate of European control of the Pacific. Maps symbolizing colonial possession. We have this wonderful map of North America by Heinrich Scherer, uh, made in 1702. And in the lower right, we have a very interesting depiction of uh, colonial powers and the territories that they claimed in the New World. And that is made by maps. So if we zoom in, we have this detail of the cartouche. And we have three maps showing the territorial claims of the French, Spanish, and English in North America. So the Spanish, oh, sorry, the French claims are Louisiana and the Great Lakes, essentially. Uh, and the title of the map is Through the Hopes of the French. Uh, the Spanish claims are New Mexico and California. And the title of the map is Through the Care of the Spanish. So indicating a bit more activity than Through the Hopes of the French. And then the English claims, basically the Eastern Seaboard, and through the diligence of the English. So indicating, I would suggest, even more, um, more active engagement with these uh, claims and colonial activities. And if we look closely at the titles of the three maps, the titles of the French and Spanish maps are sort of peeling off uh, the rest of the map, whereas that on the English map is not which tends to suggest, again, this firmer engagement by the English. And then we have these uh, representations of Huron and Iroquois Indians in subservient positions and seeming to accept European control of their lands. So maps are deployed here to uh, very, in this very visual way to support the territorial claims of European powers with this uh, clear indication that the, the English seem more serious about all this. So stitching together an empire, we have this uh, wonderful map of um, the, the Russian empire by Johann Trescott and Jakob Schmidt from 1776. I'm going to show a, a copy of this map in color, just because it's a bit more attractive, by Santini, published in 1782. And in the lower right-hand corner, we have this amazing image of Catherine the Great, Empress of Russia, who ruled from 1762 to 1796, surrounded by the equipment of war. And beside her is the god Mercury, the Roman god of good fortune, who's helping her do something and they're joining together two maps with a thread. Not an image you see very often. The map that Catherine holds shows the heart of the Russian empire, including St. Petersburg, uh, Moscow, and Toplos. Whereas the map that Mercury holds, holds shows the area around the Black Sea, and thus specifically Russia's territorial gains in the Russian Russia-Turkish war, which concluded in 1774, two years before Prescott's map. So the stitching together of the maps is indicating this new addition to the Russian Empire. 
maps and the god of war. So according to the famed general and military theorist Karl von Clausewitz, Napoleon was the god of war himself. And Napoleon was obsessed with maps. And this is uh, an aspect of Napoleon that I don't think has really gotten enough coverage in uh, the various multifarious writings about him. He viewed them as essential to understanding the battlefield and to developing tactics that would lead to victory. So here's a painting of uh, Napoleon uh, preparing for battle in July of 1809. We zoom in, we see that he's holding a map um, and he's passing it on to his subordinate who has slung across his back a cylindrical case to store the map in. An image like this we can see of, of many other generals, uh, but there are other features about Napoleon's interest in maps that we should have a look at. Napoleon preferred very large scale maps and in 1808 ordered the production of the uh, carte militaire d'Allemagne on a scale of one to 100,000. A copy of this map survives in the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin. It's on 254 sheets, which if assembled would measure about 29 by 24 feet. And there are other examples of these enormous maps that Napoleon commissioned. And here's the index map of those 254 sheets. So it's a staggeringly large production. And we have some amazing quotes that really bring out Napoleon's obsession with maps. So Jacques de Norvin in his Souvenir d'un historien de Napoleon reports that just before the Battle of Heilsburg on June 10th, 1807, after arriving on the large flat plateau which crowned, crowned the height, the emperor reined in his horse and leapt to the ground calling out, Berthier, my maps. Immediately the grand equerry made a sign to the staff orderly bearing the portfolio of maps, opened the case and handed it to the chief of staff who hatless spread an immense map on the turf. Onto this, the emperor advanced on his knees, then on all fours, and lastly, at full length, lying on the map at full length, using this small pencil to mark it up. In this position, he remained for a full half hour in deep silence. In front of him, awaiting a sign or an order, stood the motionless grand dignitaries, their heads uncovered despite the blazing sun of the northern summer lying full length on the map for a full half hour. And Ernst uh, Odeleben in his Mit Napoleon in Im Felde in 1813 writes, if Napoleon stayed at the bivouac with, his, with the troops an adjoining one for his cabinet was immediately set up right next to his own tent, meticulously arranged time after time. In the middle of the room stood a large table on which the best map of the theater of war was spread out. In Saxony, it was Petri's map because Napoleon had become accustomed to it in the year 1806 and held it in high esteem. It was still the same exemplar of the map, usually properly oriented before his arrival and adorned with pins whose tips were colorful, placed everywhere to mark the positions of the various army corps and the enemy. This task was handled by the director of his topographical bureau who had to work almost incessantly with him and was most familiar with the positions. If this map wasn't ready, it had to be brought immediately after his arrival, as it was his portable home, seeming to him to be more dear than other necessities of life. At night, it was illuminated by perhaps 20 to 30 lights with a compass placed in the center. When he mounted his horse, the Grand Equerry uh, uh carried the necessary sheet of map fastened on his chest because he was always closer to, closest to Napoleon, so that he could offer it to him when he said, the map. So this was a man deeply obsessed with maps as tools to helping him achieve military victory. And uh, one final example from the 20th century. So World War II was a particularly map intensive conflict. I think it's fair to say. And this is from the New York Times, February 23rd, 18, uh, sorry, 1942. And at the top, it says, clip and save this map for use during the president's broadcast night. So maps were an, an, an essential tool in understanding this global conflict. There were articles about the uh, special equipment and, and techniques used for the rapid creation, printing, and distribution of maps to US commanders in the field. So war maps while you, made, while you wait, an article in Popular Mechanics. And another 
article, this one in the Illustrated London News, talks about a new type of map, uh, revolution in aerial map making, perspective maps for airmen uh, in December of 1943. And it talks about the creation of this type of map, which is a very specific map for use in bombing missions. Um, perspective target mapping for bombers in a US day operation. So it's this type of map. And here's an example of one of those maps. They were devised by Major G.K. Yearlings of the U.S. Air Force. The center map looks straight down on the target, as we would expect, whereas the four surrounding maps show how the target is seen from each approach in different directions. So this is a map designed to help the U.S., in this case, achieve power by destroying their enemy. It's a, the clearest possible relation between maps and power. And this map shows all of the locations for which these types of targeting maps were made. So this was a, a very extensive cartographic enterprise about which we hear little today. And, and there really aren't that many of these maps that survive. To end on a more optimistic note, uh, a quote by Samuel Boggs, who wrote that he who would solve world problems must understand them. He who would understand world problems must visualize them. And he would visualize world problems should study them on the spherical surface of a globe. So maps can be used for the, uh, the power of good as well. I'll just close by saying that it's interesting that um, in the, the earlier examples I uh, mentioned, maps are most often used symbolically uh, as uh, symbols of power, whereas in the more recent examples, the maps are often used uh, as means to achieve uh, power, uh, a tool to achieve power. Thank you very much.